Hey friends, today we're gonna to be talking about um, mental health and coping and what are the things that we see in the ICU related to the mental health. So there's a couple things that we see. Um, one, we see delirium, you know, and so we'll start talking about how do we prevent it, how do we treat it, and how do we even recognize it. Um, we see suicide. Unfortunately, we see suicides um, that are in the process of being successful or are actually successful. Um, we see schizophrenics that come in um, either on or off their medications and so we have to adjust to those kinds of things. We see families in crisis and a lot of families are in crisis when they're in our ICUs. And so we have to think about how are we going to work with and treat those families drugs, lots of drugs in the ICU, um, lots of overdoses, whether they're intentional or unintentional, and then the consequences that come with it. And drugs are anything from alcohol to Tylenol to the amphetamines and the psychedelics, all sorts of different kinds of drugs. So making sure we're paying attention to not just the drugs that we think the street drugs, but also the legal drugs and the complications that they cause. So let's go ahead and dig into some of this information. Let's talk about delirium. What is it? So it's not fully understood at this point in time, but the idea that the delirium is coming off of all the medications we give our patients when they're in the ICU, all the sedatives, all the, the paralytics, the um, uh, narcotics, all the stuff that we give, plus probably the antibiotics and steroids. I mean, no, let's just be honest, no one feels great when they're on steroids. So um, we're pumping all this into somebody's body to try and keep them alive or help them survive a big event in their life. And so the confusion naturally happens because there's that disconnect from the real world and the world they're in. I had a friend who was on a ventilator or on um, BiPAP, which is that full face mask, and he said he had such vivid dreams that he was stuck in a jar. So you can imagine how confusing and how scary that was for him. When we're thinking about um, delirium, we want to recognize it first. So we're going to assess, 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 assess. Can I, I cannot say it enough. You're going to assess. You're going to look for increased agitation. You're going to look for restlessness, maybe fighting the ventilator um, where they weren't fighting it before. Delirium is going to happen, but we're going to assess um, and we're going to do, there's the CAM scale, which is the confusion assessment method. Um, so different ICUs are going to use different tools. Remember, we try and make everything into a number so that we can um, so we can measure it and we can evaluate whether it's getting better or worse but we really need to be able to recognize the other thing we're gonna be able to do have to do is we're gonna have to treat it so we can't have people pulling out tubes or any of that stuff so think about the things that we do restraints restraints become really important either the wrist restraints um, or the mitt restraints sometimes we just don't want them pulling on stuff or swatting at things um, we might have to increase sedation the other part is family. You know, they hear the family talking and so they may turn to them or they may try and figure out where that voice is coming from. So we're gonna wanna tell them everything we're doing. Even if they're sedated, we wanna be really clear in what we're doing. Hey, George, I'm gonna turn you. Um, you're not gonna fall, I've got you. Because that startle uh, impact is still there very much from um, as our, our reflexes that we have. So we're going to be working with family to do a lot of education when they're like, oh my gosh, she's getting so upset. He's starting to pull at things. Yeah, there's a little confusion as their body's kind of processing out of these um, medications and all of that. So we see those kinds of things with delirium. The big thing to do is if we can prevent it, it is so much better for all of us. Now, it becomes a challenge to prevent because we've got to give the medications that potentially are causing it. Patients are in renal failure, so they're or uh, they're not getting stuff flushed out. They're in liver failure, so they're not getting stuff flushed out that way. So these chemicals are building up in their system. Some of the medications we give are fat soluble, like propofol. So propofol, if you've got somebody who is overweight, the propofol attaches to the um, to the fat cells and can take longer to come out of somebody who is overweight. Um, or they might burn out of it quicker, depending on what's going on, how fast they're metabolizing. And we won't know until we get in there and we start giving them these medications. 
So it's really important if we can recognize it early and we can treat it, then it's great, but we may, if we can prevent it before it even starts. So things, other things we can do to prevent. Pain management is the number one. If people are in pain, we're gonna start that delirium process because they're gonna be restless, they're gonna be moving, they're gonna be shifting. Um, it increases their awareness to what's going on. If we can keep that pain under control, we help manage the delirium process. So giving them the analgesics and the sedatives to try and keep them as comfortable as possible. Um, early mobilization. So I know you guys laugh at me all the time when I say bag and drag, but that literally is what we called it when it's like, oh, room 410, we need to bag and drag today. And it meant at that time, we literally would pop somebody onto like an ambu bag and we would walk them and ambulate them. Um, now our vents are mobile, so we'll take the vent with us, but we will walk people because that early mobilization gets you up, gets those lungs nice and open, and it gets, um, those muscles moving and all those chemicals that have sort of sat in those little pockets and little areas, it gets them moved through so they're being processed, metabolized, and gotten out. So think about those kinds of things as you're working with your delirium patients that you recognize when something's going on, when there's a change, when that increased restlessness is happening so we can get the safety interventions put in. If we can treat it um, when they're starting to get restless, like assess, are they in pain? Are they having anxiety? Are they fighting the tube? Are they biting the tube? You know, those kinds of things to treat. Um, it may be as simple as we need to put a bite block on them while we pump up that propofol a little bit more um, or the Versed or the fentanyl or whatever drugs we're using of choice. And then if we can prevent it, if we can prevent it and we can stay on top of it, then we will help ourselves helping them stay more comfortable and kind of get us through the shift a little bit easier um, if we can get them through without getting some sort of delirium. All right, let's take on the hard one, suicide. There's three things that you need to pretty much know about suicide for caring for patients who have um, either completed or attempted uh, suicide, and that is self-awareness, grief process, and then safety, all right? So if they are in your ICU from a suicide attempt, um, whether they have completed it and someone found them and we are in the process of maybe organ donation or helping the family process and go through it, um, or they've just done a really big number on themselves and now we're trying to help them get back, it can be incredibly triggering. You need to know yourself and where you are in the process of working through suicide. Let's just be honest, there are judgments out there. Um, whether they are intentional, unintentional, um, we think we have them under wraps, but they're not. Like People can feel it if you're not, um, if you're not self-aware about this one, if you don't understand your values or where you are in processing um, the suicide aspects of life, um, tell someone you can't take the patient. Like the family doesn't need us not knowing how where we stand on this one and the family really needs um, help because they're gonna be going through that grieving process and it's so complicated because think about what's one of the first stages of grief is anger and you are taking it all on and then they feel the guilt because of the anger and so there's just that complicated emotional turmoil. Know that it is not your anger to own when the families are angry. It's just yours to help them process. So don't, don't bear that weight on your shoulders. It's not yours to own, um, but it's yours to witness. And so just be really aware of that. This one is hard. It's just super, super hard, especially um, a lot of the people that complete or attempt suicide are young. Um, they usually have families. They have lots of people that love them. They have a lot of complications of we didn't know. Um, and so it's really, really hard for people as they're processing through this. The last piece is safety. If you've got somebody who is attempted, not completed, the safety becomes huge. 
thinking about the every 15 minute checks, checks, they are one to one. They have someone there with them at all times. We don't have plastic bags in the room. We don't have gloves that they can get a hold of. We don't have, um, they can't have any draw strings in their clothes because they can um, do a lot of damage with them. So that safety becomes so important. The other thing is the safety for you because when people are backed into certain corners, they can become very irrational and violent. So being always aware of your safety as well is always important. But most of my suicide patients um, in the ICU, you know, they've usually done a pretty good number on themselves. Um, and so it is a huge, huge challenge. You're going to do the same things as you do with all your patients, airway, breathing, circulation, alertness, and cognition, all the same things, keeping them alive, helping them reboot. Um, and then once they're off the ventilators and those kinds of things, we're going to make sure we have some good therapy and we get maybe some um, different antidepressant medications on board. But that's, that's a long-term kind of fix and healing process. My biggest thing is just be aware that what we see oftentimes on our patients and on our families is not what they feel. And I think that picture is so perfect of what, you know, it's sort of that Facebook front, but real life messy back. You know, we don't see all those dark things. We don't see that internal dialogue. We don't see the, 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 the self um, pain that people have and so just being really aware where you are because we want just don't want to take judgment into that room um, and not that it's intended or malicious or any of those kinds of things so just being really aware of those um, challenges that come with these patients because it is so visceral it's so visceral um, we feel it at our depths um, and we have our own anger and things to process. So make sure when you're working with these patients that you have that self-awareness, that you understand the grieving process and the anger that you're about to see from these families as it's very complicated. Um, and then the safety piece of it, if we do get them off the ventilator and then have some of that long-term care, the one-to-one -one safety parts, um, then you know, making sure nothing's in their room that's unsafe for them to get a hold of, um, you know, and, and truly make sure if your CNA is, um, or your, um, nurse tech or psych tech or whatever you have is in the room with them, make sure they're paying attention because it doesn't take long for someone to get a hold of something they shouldn't or go into the bathroom by themselves and grab something they shouldn't. Or, um, I mean, it, it can be a huge challenge to keep these patients safe. So make sure you're keeping those kinds of priorities um, in your head as you're working with these types of patients. And then always remember to be kind to yourself because these are hard patients to take. And there's a lot of triggers that you may or may not know that you have until you take care of one. Let's talk about schizophrenia. So big things with schizophrenics when they come into the ICU is build trust. They will not take any meds from you if you do not have trust. And then safety, 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 both for the patient and yourself. And so we'll talk about those each in a little bit more depth. But first, let's talk about schizophrenia and what schizophrenia is. Schizophrenia is a really complex um, pathological issue in the brain. Uh, has problems with hormones. It has problems with receptors. Um, and so it has this really complex pathophysiology. It has what they call positive signs and negative signs. And positive signs are the hallucinations, um, seeing things, tasting things, um, hearing things. Or it can have negative symptoms, which is like speech complications and like lack of motivation. So there's all these different parts that go with schizophrenia. Delusions are the... Um, the false beliefs they have delusions they that a lot of times you'll get paranoid schizophrenics where they'll think you know that the aliens are talking to them or in their brain so they'll have the the you know aluminum foil hats and that kind of stuff those are the delusions hallucinations are usually going to be more sensory where they are seeing hearing feeling touching any of that kind of stuff so those are kind of some of the eerie the challenges with it if a patient is coming to your ICU um, and they have schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, 
it's not usually why they come to the ICU. Um, usually if they're coming to the ICU, it's they've done something that has put them either in a traumatic injury or they've gotten ill. I mean, they still get sick. Just because they have schizophrenia doesn't mean they're, they're immune from all other illnesses. So they have sepsis, they have an infection, they have a, a perfed bowel, whatever it is, they've got something going on that puts them in the ICU. We're going to take care of the physiologic, the physical needs first, and then we'll take care of the mental health needs and the coping and all that kind of stuff second. But um, it can add extra layers of complications due to different medications that they're on. And um, we talked about delirium earlier. That can add some challenges because you might think they're having delirium, but really it's this, their schizophrenia starting to kind of show through. So that can be a really big challenge. Some of the different drugs that they're on, um, they're on antipsychotics. So a couple of them are Haldol, which is why people have such a problem with Haldol when we use it for other things because they think, oh, Haldol, schizophrenic, antipsychotic, bad. And it's like, no, Haldol is a really amazing drug if it's used for the right reasons. So Haldol is one drug you might see people on. Thorazine is another one. Those are kind of your antipsychotics. There's a whole list of them, but those are just a couple of them. And then you've got a couple, then you've got other, like they call them second generation medications. Some of them you might know already. Abilify, um, cla uh, Clazepine, Zyprexa, Seroquel, um, Geodon. We use Geodon for other things. Like if I have a patient that's not going down and is like throwing things and irate, um, we'll geodon them and that means we're, we're putting them down so that they don't continue to harm us or the others. So let's talk about the, the two things that we really hit on was the trust and the safety. You have to build trust with these patients. They will not take a medication from you if they do not trust you. They will think that you are sent to you know them with God or whatever and you are here to poison them, whatever it is. You may be giving, trying to give them like a Ducalax or something, you know, some Miralax or a suppository or something, and they think you're giving them some poison. Um, so it can be really, really challenging to build that trust with them. You have to go slow. Now, in the ICU, slow is not something we are very accustomed to. So it can be really, really, really hard to build that trust with them. And once you have trust, keep it. If you say you're going to be in that room at in an hour, you better be there in an hour. Like with that patient, even more so important because they need that consistency to build that trust with you. So it's really, really important. The other thing then is safety. Making sure the patient is safe and you are safe. Because these patients, when depending where they are in their delusion um, or in their hallucination, they can become very violent. They can become very, very dangerous. Not all, right? These patients are, you know, unfortunately have different things going on in their heads. And so we've just got to be really careful. I had a patient one time that came because he thought um, he had barricaded himself in his own apartment. He was a like second or third year college student. And his dad was coming to try and find him because no one had heard from him for days or weeks. And so they came in and they um, like we're knocking on his door, couldn't get in and couldn't get in. And then the son was like so scared and paranoid that he actually jumped off his balcony and like broke both his legs and like had a head injury then and all sorts of stuff. Like such a sad case, but it's like, that's kind of what we see. A lot of times people don't know they have schizophrenia until they have some sort of event. The other thing for safety is when you have elderly patients that are in dementia and all that kind of stuff, you don't reorient them, right? You you let them live in their delusion. You let them live in their space and their place and their time. Um, unless, of course, it's scary or sad. Then you might try and get them out. With schizophrenics, we're going to try and reorient them to reality. Now, if it's not safe to do it, then don't. But if it's safe and you've assessed that, um, then you're going to try and re uh, reorient them. You're going to say, no, they, there are not snakes in here. It is just you and I. There are no snakes on the floor. I'm touching the floor. There's no snakes on the floor. So we're going to try and reorient them to reality always bringing them back that you are safe, you are with, you know, the nurse, you are with, you know, your nurse tech, whatever it is, bringing them back into that reality is really important and can help you again build that trust. And the other thing with safety is those medications that we talked about, 
they need to be on board. If they have been held for some reason, um, that's something we want to make sure we verify with the doctor of why we're holding that medication because that medication, it takes months and weeks to get those medications to the levels they need to be to be effective for the patient. And when we hold them because, you know, they ha they've been intubated and all this kind of stuff, um, then there, those levels are starting to drop, which then think about the safety issues that come in with it. So that's one of the big things with schizophrenics is making sure that their meds are given um, consistently. And if they're not, um, because maybe they're intubated and so we can't give them orally, well, do we have a way to give them, you know, through a, through a peg tube or an NG tube, or do we have a way of giving them IV or some other route so that we can keep these meds and keep them stable and on board? Really, really important for these patients. Um, a lot of them come in because they couldn't afford their meds or they went off their meds or they didn't like the way they felt on their meds, and so they went off of them. So you'll see a lot, if you work in an area where you see schizophrenics, sometimes you'll get some of those repeat patients. The meds have side effects and they feel icky and people feel not creative when they have those meds on board. So it's something to think about when you're working with these patients. Think about the picture and the image that um, I have with this on this slide, that's Salvador Dali. Think if that was your reality, that face kind of being sliding off, like, would you trust what's around you? Would you feel like you could take medications or take things from people? It's kind of an interesting reality, but remember, trust, build trust with them. It's so important. If you get that trust, keep it. Um, and then safety, keep yourself safe, keep them safe. Um, you know, and safety can be lots of things. Thinking about the room they're in, thinking about all the stuff we have in those rooms. Think about your ICU rotations and all the stuff we have in those rooms. We may not be able to have all those things in those rooms. Um, or is it time to get them transferred to an area that um, they will be more safe? So let's talk about the other pretty hard one that we see in the ICU a lot, and that's families in crisis we see a lot of families in crisis and we've got to be able to work with them. And so here are some steps or some ideas to help you as you work with these families, build a relationship with them, be honest and don't own it. They're going to come at you with a lot of feelings. They are not yours to own. It's theirs to own. We just have to help them guide them what we, with what we can. So when we talk about relationship, building a relationship with patients is crucial in the ICU and building a relationship with those families is so important to build that trust so they know that you are taking care of their loved one with everything you've got. Um, and we're not messing up and we're not, you know, that, that anger is there, that fear is there. It's intense, it can be taking over. So we have to build that relationship. How you walk into a room, builds a relationship. If you come in um, scattered and all sort of chaotic energy, really, really tough for the families. They get real um, frazzled and they feed off that energy. So how you enter that room. So if you need to outside that room, you take that breath, that cleansing breath, and you walk in. Even if you're having a bad day, you walk in, you leave that stuff outside that room. You build that relationship with them. Being honest. We want to give hope and we want to see people get better, but they don't always. And so we have to be honest. Tell them the facts. What are you looking for? What are you seeing? Here, I am assessing them for this, this, and this. I don't see two of these things. That's concerning to me. Um, you know, keeping that, that judgment out of the room for whatever reason their loved one is there. We have to make sure our judgment is out, but that's that honesty that, you know, meeting them where they are and being honest with what we see and educating on all the different monitors and all the different stuff that we see and giving them those facts. Because if we try and say like, oh, well, don't worry about these monitors, they worry about those monitors, right? So we wanna be honest with what we're looking at. This blood pressure here, it's a little lower than I'd like it to be. I want it to stay above systolic, above 80. What whatever your number is, right? Be honest with them. Give them the facts. Tell them what you're looking for. They will appreciate that. And then the last piece is probably one of the hardest pieces. 
don't own it. It's not yours to own. It is yours to witness. It's yours to see, but it is not yours to own. They have to go through this. This is their journey and their experience for whatever their loved one is going through and um, is trying to beat or get over. Um, they have to go through that journey. We can't go through it for them. We can guide them. We can be beside them. We can kind of be with them, but it's not our journey. Um, it's just our space to sort of help them, but not ours to own. And that's a really, really hard thing. But if you, when you're badging out after you've had a family in crisis, who's super intense and just super distraught, when you badge out, just remember, not mine to own. I was there to help them. I did a good job, but it wasn't my hurt, my fear, my anger to own. I was just there. So it's that don't, uh, don't absorb it. You know, observe, don't absorb. Um, ours to witness, but not ours to own or take home. It's tough. It's a really, really hard thing because we see those families and we empathize with them because that's why we got into nursing, right? Because we care about people. So those families in crisis are really, really challenging. But if you build that relationship with them, they will trust you. And if you are honest with them, then they know what you're looking for and things aren't as much a surprise. You can plant seeds. And then just taking care of yourself um, in that emotional component is incredibly important. So when we're talking about drugs and drug overdoses, this gets challenging because there's lots of parts and pieces, um, but we have to understand why somebody's coming into the ICU in the first place. Are they coming in because of the, the drug or the damage the drug has done, or are they coming in for another reason and the drug is just there and causing another problem? So an example of this would be somebody gets drunk, they drive, they get into a car wreck, they're really in the ICU because of um, the car wreck has made them unstable. It's broken their bones. It's had blood loss, all that kind of stuff. The alcohol really didn't, I mean, it played a role in the, in the accident, but it's not really playing a role necessarily in the ICU. While a patient, uh, someone that's coming in for um, alcohol toxicity, then the alcohol is the issue and we have to fix that. So that's kind of where you start want to start thinking about why are they coming into the ICU? Why, why do they need to be in this high acuity environment? What happened that made them unstable? So did the alcohol or did the drugs play a role in it or are they the reason that they're here? So we start with kind of that theory and then we start going into kind of the bigger topics. So you have like your opiates, alcohol, and kind of then all your other pills, street drugs, amphetamines, all those kinds of things. Because drug overdoses don't have to be all the street drugs that we think about. I've had people that have been in the ICU because of um, Tylenol overdoses or Advil, um, all of those drugs. Anything we put in our body comes with a cost and we put lots of it in, it comes with lots of bigger costs. So that's kind of the things that we start to think about too is what's the drug, what damage is it doing to the body and how do we fix it? Okay, so let's start with opiates because that's one we see a lot. Um, we have just a huge issue with opiates because what used to be like heroin, right? Because that's an opiate um, and no one would touch heroin, but oh, I'll take a, a pill at a party. That's an opiate, right? It's still a narcotic. It's still causing all the problems. Think about the problems that we have when we give opiates to patients that, for prescriptions, right? They have hip pain, we give them um, a hydrocodone. What do we look for? We look for respiratory changes. We look for blood pressure dropping. We look for heart rate decrease. We look for, um, you know, they get constipated. We're doing tons of education. So when we have patients that have chronic or come in for an overdose, we're looking for all those same things. We're looking for constipation issues. We're looking for the respiratory issues. We're looking for the blood pressure and the heart rate issues. We're looking for all those same things. With opiates, um, one thing that we always wanna pay attention to is their pupils. I know you guys laugh at me all the time because the pupils, I'm always like, what are their pupils doing? But the pupils just tell so much about a person. Um, with our opiates, our pupils will be pinpoint and tiny and they won't really react to light because they're so constricted. Um, and so that'll let you know that we have o an opiate overdose or something on board with that opiate effect. Um, what we'll do is we've got a, an antidote to it called Narcan. Narcan works great. We can give it IV. They, um, people give it um, intranasally now. Um, so we've got lots of ways we can give it. However, 
opiates last longer, which is why we don't have to give them every hour, right? We can give an Oxycontin and it lasts 12 hours. The problem is, is Narcan doesn't last that long. And so our problem becomes when somebody gets Narcan and then they feel better or they are mad because you just wasted their high and now they leave, um, they're dead in a ditch 40 minutes later because their Narcan wore off and the opiate came back. So we have to really be careful when we're giving Narcan that we've got people pretty secured into it. If we have to, we'll put somebody on a Narcan drip if, because we need that continuous release of that medication so that that will last. So those are kind of our opiates that we worry about. If somebody's withdrawing off an opiate, just all those same things, right? When we give opiates, um, they get constipated, all, they're, they don't feel things as much, all that stuff. So now when they're withdrawing off of it, they have increased bowel motility, which means they're going to have a lot of bowel cramps and diarrhea. They're going to have sweats and agitation and all this kind of stuff because all those nerve endings are starting to wake up. And so they're just get really restless and agitated and they might be vomiting and they might be like just they look like a hot mess when they are coming off those opiates. Um, the other one that we see a lot is alcohol. I mean, it's, it's legal, um, for anyone 21 and over and we see a lot of issues with it. Um, I at least every fall get at least one kid in one or two kids in the ICU. That's what we call too drunk to breathe. Alcohol is a depressant. It depresses the ability to breathe or that drive to breathe. Um, the other way it causes problems is people vomit and they aspirate on their vomit. That's why we try and always tell people to turn people to their side if they've had a ton of alcohol. Um, so a really bad hangover would be waking up on the ventilator after a night of a bender. So um, if we can get some education out there and tell people like alcohol is dangerous more than just the car wrecks, um, it is a toxin in your body. When people are withdrawing off of alcohol, we have um, different scales. The Siwa scale is one that was used a lot when I was here um, in Lincoln, um, but there are other scales out there. They're measuring devices to try and be able to fluctuate and measure where somebody is in the withdrawal, and then it guides us onto the drugs that we can give. Ativan is a drug that we give often when people are in withdrawal. Presidex, um, which is a, a sedative or an, an, an anxiolytic, um, that is one that's an IV drip that we can give when people are kind of coming off of, of alcohol. Um, alcohol is pretty bad. If somebody's been on alcohol for a prolonged period in their life, um, they, they have a really hard time getting off of it because the body has adjusted to it. So that's the person that may never um, have a blood alcohol level of zero. They may always have some alcohol in their system um, or they may start off the day with a drink to get rid of the shakes. So the shakes are from delirium tremors, the, the shakiness of their hands, all right? And, and they'll get jittery all over. So that's why we see that. And that's that those nerve endings just get real, um, just bathed in alcohol. So they're just not as receptive and to moving and all that kind of stuff. And so as you pull back, as the alcohol gets down, they start having problems. Where alcohol withdrawal gets really, really scary is the seizures. If you are seizing, you are probably not breathing. And when they are having multiple seizures, you're having a lot of hypoxic events to the brain. And so that's when our alcohol pay withdrawal patients become very, very unstable and they are going to be in the ICU because we need to monitor them very, very closely. People die from alcohol withdrawal. People usually don't die from other, uh, other drug withdrawals, but alcohol withdrawal can be really, really dangerous, especially for our patients that are just used to always maintaining. And by golly, they surprise you who is. Things that we're gonna give them, thymine, we wanna get those B vitamins in there because if they've got had so much alcohol, they, it displaces a lot of those vitamins because they're just not taking them in. We wanna make sure that we're um, giving them, again, their Ativan dosages to keep them from going. Um, you'll hear a banana bag. It literally is a yellow bag of all sorts of electrolytes and nutrients that we are giving to um, patients to keep them, um, rehydrate them, and to keep those electrolytes going. So a lot of challenges that are, um, that, are that go with these. Sorry, my dog decided to move around and apparently is really loud. So, but we're going to just keep going. Other things we can do. So we've talked about our opiates and it's talked about our alcohol. Other drug overdoses are usually when we start getting people who are taking handfuls of pills we can have problems with. 
if we have somebody who's coming in because they are a drug overdose, you probably an attempted suicide, um, but they took a handful of pills, those are our patients that we're gonna probably give charcoal to and we're gonna put an NG tube down them to try and suck out um, anything we can get out of those pills. Um, if we can get them to not absorb any of that stuff. So a lot of challenges comes with our drugs. I'm not, like if you get into your amphetamines and all those kinds of things, um, those are usually going to cause like heart attacks because they're uppers and they're stimulants or kind of cause brain bleeds. I've taken care of a few um, cerebral aneurysms because of meth. Um, those are always a, an interesting situation because you're just like, oh, um, they, they literally blow a gasket in their brain. Sorry if that's not um, very empathetic, but it's just that, sorry, I see you humor comes out every once in a while. So, but those are some of the challenges that come with the drugs. Um, and all the problems. If you get Advil, um, you get your GI bleeds. I've had people that have come in with drug overdoses from um, psych meds and all that kind of stuff. Lithium is a huge one that I've run into um, that people overdose on. You can overdose on digoxin. You can overdose on a lot of different medications that we don't always pay attention to and that's why it's really important that we educate our patients to take medications as prescribed. But they're not gonna come into the ICU unless they are an unstable patient and we need to keep a closer tabs on them or if something else. Always remember that taking care of mental health takes compassion for not only the patient, but yourself as you're helping them process through some really hard moments in their